thank you to Missouri Birding Society, the Missouri Department of Conservation, who I work for, and Missouri River Bird Observatory for um, hosting the webinar and for putting it together. So we hope to hold a few more of these uh, uh, bird ID webinars between MBS and MRBO and MDC uh, in coming months. So please stay tuned. We haven't planned those yet, but they're in the works. So we'll also now be recording this webinar if folks want to tune in at a later time or share with friends and family who weren't able to attend. So again, thanks everybody for coming. So today we'll cover some ID tips and tricks for common and less common winter species, uh, including those that only occur in Missouri in the winter. The bird ID webinar we're about to host is not exhaustive. It's just kind of a smattering of some common and uh, ones that folks ask me a lot of questions about and ask Dana and Ethan a lot about at MRBO. I'm sure all of you get questions about some of these kind of tricky ones in the winter. So. If that's all of the intro stuff, um, we will just jump right in. So birding and wildlife watching uh, were growing rapidly pre-pandemic. So that especially ramped up when we were all stuck at home during spring migration and beyond that, clearly I'm in my attic <laughs> as proof <laughs> uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. So we're all, I feel like probably pretty aware that time spent outdoors by the general public ramped up. People were spending a ton of time at their homes and noticing more and more of the birds around them in their own backyards or um, needing to be outside. I think one of the, it's hard to say good parts of the pandemic. Uh, I understand that and I know that a lot of people are hurting a lot, but it, we need to find silver linings in everything. And one was that I think the public and humans felt an inherent need to get outdoors um, and they were drawn to that, uh, both for mental and physical stressors of both isolation uh, and um, a lot of things, um, stress. So, so I will go into, there was a, so the lockdown again coincided with spring migration, which helped for birding efforts anyway. But the Cornell Lab of Ornithology's live bird cams were up 45%. Cornell Lab of Ornithology's uploads of bird photos and calls was up 84% during this time. I know this is a really data heavy, image, but this is, uh, I know some folks at eBird and they sent me this dashboard of them tracking usage throughout the pandemic. On the left, you see eBird. On the right, you see the Macaulay Library, which every piece of media you put into eBird automatically is uploaded to the Macaulay Library now. But the Macaulay Library is the oldest and largest repository of uh, bird media calls, videos, um, and photos ever. And so I'll just call your attention to two little stats here out of many, but there, um, the checklist in October alone was 43% growth from the previous year, 15.6 million observations up 42%. And this is in August this, or October. This isn't in the, the busiest time when, when there are many, many downloads happening, but that's kind of shown here. You know, eBird is growing every single year, but you especially saw this massive spike uh, in March, especially and beyond when people were stuck at home. So just to show that with some data, because we got to show some data, um, but visits to outdoor spaces were up 150% in Missouri at public lands and parks. Um, we kind of got that internally at the department here, looking at uh, outdoor usage by the public. The Global Big Day, which is a, a day each spring and fall when folks get out and go birding and try and record as many birds species as they can in a day, um, was on May 9th, and that was the most bird sightings uploaded in one day on eBird. So it just attracted a lot of people who got really interested in this. Chicago Audubon Society's chapter membership or Facebook group grew 134%. I hope their membership also increased. <laughs> so uh, why well, start birding in the winter? It's a great time to start, to be really honest. There are fewer species. It's a little less overwhelming. Uh, there aren't species singing at you nonstop, setting up their breeding territories. Um, you can set up a feeder outside when birds need it most in the year. And so it's a set kind of small number of species that you can control the environment. You can easily look at birds at a feeder who are coming there over and over and over. It's kind of, you can take more time to study what they look like and study their behavior. So sometimes if you can control that environment, it's a little easier than going out in the woods and trying to find warblers fl flitting around in the canopy. There are fewer distractions. They're a little bit quieter. Again, they're not as jazzed and excited about breeding seasons. So they're not singing as much. And so it's just a little easier to focus in. Plus we're all losing our minds, so why not? 
there's no better time to start than right now because what else are we going to do <laughs> besides start a new hobby um so equipment you can do this with hardly any equipment binoculars do help they help you see clearly the characteristics of the birds the plumage the amazing parts of all these different birds that we know and love um you don't want to get the cheapest binoculars because that causes eye strain and then having a field guide of some sort whether it's um, an app that's on your phone uh, like the ones on the top the audubon app is free merlin is an app from the cornell lab of ornithology that is free but there are others where you can pay 10 or 20 dollars which seems like a lot for an app but just think of it as buying a field guide that actually sings to you so you're paying you know you'd spend 10 15 dollars on a field guide so why not spend a little bit more and it gives you all the songs and calls as well um and then you know i have paper guides everybody likes a paper guide so so having binoculars and field guides is the first step Oh, oh, and also dress warmly and take food or else it won't be very fun in the winter. So we just got to plan ahead a little bit more. So jumping into, you know, at the beginning when Dana and I were planning this, I had a bunch of these intro to bird watching slides and we didn't really have a lot of time for that, which may be a topic in the future of how to get started bird watching um, for its own webinar. But, you know, a lot of people I meet who get started bird watching or I'm, I'm teaching a training at work with staff who are learning their birds, it's really overwhelming. And most of you know this, if you're already birders or if you're beginners, it can be really overwhelming to know where to start. But I would challenge you all to look at this picture that's on your screen uh, and we'll go through a few of these. So in the top right, you may not know what species, but generally what is this? It's a hawk or raptor. What are these in the middle? I'm gonna pretend everybody's yelling at me, but stay muted. <laughs> Canada goose, this one with the pointy tail that's on an electric line. Morning dove. What about this one? It's an owl, Sarah. That's right, it is an owl. I can just sit here and talk to myself all evening. A gull, a heron, a duck. See, you, see, so I would assume that most of you knew what many of those silhouettes are. My point is that you know more than you think you do. And so give yourself that credit. It's okay. We all got to start somewhere. And our big point of bird ID in the beginning is don't feel stupid. I try and say that to everybody who's trying to learn their birds. Don't feel stupid. Ask lots of good questions. So put all your questions in the chat while we're doing this. We'll go through them at the end. So it's, uh, so size and shape is the first big thing that we really want to talk about or the last thing before we get into the species, just because it helps us narrow down species and makes their ID in a book or an app more approachable. Or if you're asking another birder, hey, I saw this bird the other day. One of the first things we'll probably say is, what size was it? How big was it? And even just looking at these silhouettes, I bet you know what they are. What's the biggest one? It's a crow. What's the second one? Droopy wings, it's a robin. And the last one, while you may not know the species, it's a sparrow. And so you're able to it gives you a place to start, so it's a little less overwhelming. When explaining to others what you saw, it was bigger than a crow, smaller than a robin, it's bigger than a sparrow. It had a tail or a bill like a robin or sparrow. Um, so it just gives us a starting point. So that's our um, high level ID note um, on that one. So we will hopefully dive into intro to bird ID at a future one, which would be really nice for people just starting out. So we'll start with a few of the more common ones. Um, this is black capped and Carolina chickadees. So black capped is on the left and Carolina is on the right. You would imagine that these are hard to parse apart. Um, they do look very similar. This bird is a generalist, which means it can breed and spend time in multiple types of habitats, including forest, woodland, even backyards, urban areas, as you likely know if you have a bird feeder. Um, they're also a cavity nester, which is interesting, and cavity rooster in the winter. They're not a rooster, cavity rooster. And the difference between these two is very subtle, and it's funny to start out on one that's so tedious with its ID differentiating the two. So a few things which I would not expect everybody to get right off the bat if you're a beginner is that on the black cap, the line between the black on the throat and the breast is rough. It's not like a clean cut black and white line. There's a little roughness there. And on Carolina, it's more clean cut, um, which I know is hard to notice. There's also more white in the primaries on a black cap than on the Carolina. I know this is silly. <laughs> Plus, to make things harder, there's a hybrid zone in the whole middle of the state. So if I see a chickadee in Columbia or anywhere near the center of the state, 
I can't technically say what species it is because they hybridize and we're not going to know anyway. Um, so the songs are a little bit diagnostic, but again, in the hybrid zone, it's really hard to tell. So a black capped has two clear notes for its song. Just that two note, one higher, one lower. And then it does a bunch of chattering that both of them do. And then the Carolina goes, so four instead of two, which it does three at first. My friend's mnemonic for this one is, I will kill you. She told me that. It seems violent. <laughs> okay, Dana, do you have any other comments on the chickadee? I don't, that was perfect. And you're cracking me up and Ethan's across the room cracking up as well. <laughs> you know, I don't know about the, I will kill you thing, the I will kill you thing's a new one to me, but. Kill you, but I bet you won't forget it. See the stupid no. mnemonics. And they can be pretty aggressive. So it they might can. be somewhat accurate. That's true. Okay, cool. Let's go to the next one. All right, so we have two, we put these together just because they're cavity nesters and we thought that would be fun to lump them together. And these are a little bit more common. People might know these or recognize these. So on the left is tufted titmouse. Um, you see that tuft, that crest on the top of its head, hence the name. Gray top, gray underside kind of, it's a little white on its belly, but you see that buffy under the wing. But this is pretty much the predominant gray bird with a crest you're gonna see at a bird feeder, um, big black eye. Um, and both tit mice and chickadees grab a seed and then they take it to a nearby perch and get the seed out and attack it. Um, their song, they say, Peter, 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 Peter. And for some of these mnemonics where they say words to you, I always, I always try and tell people when I'm teaching folks mnemonics, like how they remember the sound of a bird, Peter, Peter, putting words to it. Um, I just tell people whatever works, whatever mnemonic you hear, you just remember that and do your thing. So I don't want to like influence the mnemonics that you add to it, but it's a widely known one that it says Peter, Peter, Peter. So um, in the breeding bird um, ID workshop I do for our staff, we get into some really funny mnemonics because we have a lot more emphasis on the songs. Okay, so white-breasted nuthatch. This is another fairly common one. These are both resident birds, which means they don't migrate. They're here year round. So white-breasted nuthatch, just super, super handsome bird has that slate blue gray back with some black in the wings, um, white underneath and that black um, stripe going straight down the head. This is the female, because we can't forget females, different plumage here. And they have a nasally wah, 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 wah. <laughs> Their call, they also go uh -uh, uh -uh, uh -uh, like they're saying uh uh. So that's just another way to remember it. Okay, red breasted nuthatch. This is a really fun one too. They are only here in the winter. And so you won't see these year round. And so they use forest woodland. They really like pines. Um, they can use backyards and feeders as we have seen this year because it's an eruption year. Um, if you've never seen that word, we'll talk about what that means. So an eruption year occurs when there's a food shortage in a food shortage in the boreal where this species nests um, due to various environmental factors like disease or there could be a drought or fire the previous growing season. And so some species are kind of pushed south in, ser in search of food because there's just not an overabundance. So a few species can have eruption years like red breasted nuthatch like this guy, pine siskins, evening grosbeaks and even snowy owls, which there's been one at BK Leach. Um, snowy owls are not a pine seed shortage, but normally due to a shortage of lemmings or small rodents. And so red breasted nuthatch, to refocus on this guy, they occur here in the winter, but whether it's a regular, a regular number of kind of random individuals that are down here or eruption year, meaning there are a bunch of them being pushed down, is determined by food sources uh, in the boreal. So this is their range map. This is an abundance map. It shows where birds are more or less concentrated. So the darker the color, the more birds there are. And this is made by eBird. 
And so it shows a really large winter range, but how abundant those birds are year to year varies whether it's an eruption year or not. This year is certainly an eruption year. We've seen many, many of these birds across the state in backyards and on people's properties. And when I'm doing the monitoring for brown-headed nuthatches, which we reintroduced to the state this last August and September, these red-breasted nuthatches are everywhere in those shortleaf pine woodlands down in the Ozarks. So if you want to hear like six or seven or eight red-breasted nuthatches nearly everywhere you go, go to shortleaf pine woodlands in the Ozarks because they are everywhere. They're really using the Ozarks a lot. Instead of that wah, 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 they say toot, toot, toot. I think they say toot, toot, toot. <laughs> a little more nasal, high-pitched, white-breasted. Okay. All right. Am I turning this over to you, Dana? Or yes, but still controlling the slides, I hope. Yes. <laughs> okay, good. Great. Okay, so here is one of our resident birds. So here, year round, the Carolina wren. Um, and we have a couple different wren species here, but this is one that we are gonna see all winter. <clears throat> um, they are largely insectivorous. They eat fruits, but they also do eat seeds. So I don't know about everyone else on this call, but they certainly do come to our sunflower seed feeders. Um, particularly the open platform ones and kind of grab seeds and go off. Um, and I, this is one of my favorite birds in Missouri, maybe everywhere. Um, and one of the reasons for that is because their song is so incredibly strident. Um, now Sarah's going to play it, right? So a lot of folks say that that sounds like tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle. And I think in the second um, song that you heard Sarah play, that was pretty obvious that tea kettle, tea kettle. Um, one thing I will object to about this species, however, is that they're so loud that when they do come sing by my bedside at five in the morning during summer, I, that, I do not appreciate them at that particular point. But it's just amazing to me how such a small bird can belt out such a voluminous song. Go ahead. So focusing on a bird that's here in the winter, um, the winter wren looks quite similar to the house wren, which is a bird that breeds here in Missouri. But as the name implies, and as the range map that you can see there is showing, um, the little winter wren um, is here just in our winter time. And this is a species that is substantially smaller than the Carolina wren. And one of the things that I find easiest about them, especially if I'm just seeing, you know, partial glimpses of the bird or it's backlit and kind of far away, that really short tail um, on a winter wren, it makes it um, distinguishable from other wrens. And you can see right here in this picture, it's displaying the super typical wren behavior with the tail kind of cocked up in the back there. And this is their beautiful song. It's a very complex, very long, bubbly, high-pitched song. Edge brings up a point, I can see, I can still see the chat because Sarah's controlling the screen, that in very cold winters, um, Carolina runs may perish or move, some may perish or move south. So when we have a particularly harsh winter, um, Carolina wren is one of the species that doesn't do quite as well as say um, the chickadees and nuthatches um, and titmice that Sarah was talking about earlier. So thanks for bringing that up, Edge. I actually do personally, every time we have a really bad cold snap here, I, that's a species that I worry most about. So bluebirds, um, we put the Eastern bluebird in just because 
Um, it's, you know, this bird is also a resident. It breeds here. Um, a lot of people are familiar with this. This is, you know, the bluebird is one that is delightful to put up boxes for. Um, but know that they will also use those boxes for roosting in the winter because they do, they do winter here. Um, they might not be the same individuals. So for example, you know, our birds that breed here in the summer might move south to say Arkansas and we might be getting birds from, you know, Iowa or Wisconsin, but it is a species that is here all year round. So Sarah's put up the, the eBird abundance map and we'll listen to their song as well. So it, that may, for some folks, kind of remind you a little bit maybe of the song of a robin and the bluebird is also a thrush. Um, and so they kind of have that nice melodic sounding song that sounds nice to our ears. The American goldfinch. Now this is one, um, when I first started birding um, and I was actually in Illinois at the time, but <clears throat> no matter. Um, this is a bird that I thought was not around in the winter. And I've met folks in Missouri that um, think that they leave. And I can see why they think that because their plumage becomes very, very different. So you can see there on the left is the breeding plumage of the male and female goldfinch. And then um, there's a nice arrow there showing you that this is their plumage in the winter time. Another pretty complex song there and that the words at the bottom there, potato chip, particularly in flight, they will go potato chip, potato chip. And then sometimes they'll go what sounds like to me, potato chip, dip, potato chip, dip. Everybody hears something different. Uh, <laughs> thing about this bird is that they're the only bird that feeds their young seeds which you wouldn't think that that would work super well, but they feed their young seeds, which is why they're late nesters uh, in predominantly July and August, because that's when seeds come out, when a lot of plants go to seed. So I think that's so fascinating. It seems real silly. I feel like you have to give them insects as well. <laughs> they are the latest as far as the, when they commence the breeding season. I believe they're the very latest, aren't they? Yes. Yep, I believe so as well. Great. So keep that bird in mind. And then here we are at the pine siskin. Um, so this is a winter bird. And as Sarah mentioned earlier, this is also a bird that erupts in its movements. It has eruption years. Um, and this is one. This year is one. So this is a pretty exciting year to be birding. Um, so you can see that they do look sort of similar to a goldfinch. It's that streakiness. Um, when you're trying to tell them apart. So people use the word drab. I don't love using that word, but the, you know, the winter plumage of an American goldfinch is on the, you know, more brownish side. And obviously so is this pine siskin, but you can see those, that enormous amount of streaking and then the yellow tinges um, and various feather edging on this bird. So they sound like... So I do want to say, pardon me, as I admit someone from the waiting room. Um, so for folks that are on this, I know that we have a really, really wide range of, of different skill and experience levels that are on this Zoom tonight. And I certainly personally don't know every single person that's on it. But for folks that are beginning birders, um, I just want to say, especially right after those two songs, particularly, 
don't let sound be too intimidating. It can, you know, some people seem to pick it up really fast. I wasn't one of those people. I'm still working on song to this day. And so I think that when you hear a song like that, that's so incredibly complex and in, a, in ways, you know, those, those two songs that we just heard are, are pretty similar um, and throw in House and Purple Finch sometimes, those can be pretty similar. Um, so just don't be intimidated by any of it and don't, you know, it's just fun. Don't let yourself get frustrated by it. Yeah, that's a really good point. It can be, it's just another piece of it that's very overwhelming, but we don't mean to overwhelm you by playing all the songs, but if it helps stick in someone's brain or they're like, oh, I've heard that one before, then all the better, but yeah. Um, another thing I'd point out about this species is super, super pointy bill. Mm, thanks, yep. Noticeably not as chunky as the as the goldfinch, just super pointy. It's like a little tweezers at the end. Yes, very, very pointy. Yeah, and I also put this article from Audubon up because I thought it was funny. I'm playing it again. <laughs> but Audubon wrote an article, Pine Stiff is have taken over the country, where they talked about someone writing it, like tweeted that, Every bird in 2020 is a pine siskin. <laughs> and because there's just so many of them happening in certain parts of the world. So um, this is another species that's down on pine woodlands in the Ozarks. There are a lot of different birds happening down there. It's a really fun place to winter bird. But go ahead. Sorry, Dean. No, no, don't be. No, and they're here too. Are they in really high numbers in the Ozarks? There are a lot. I'm seeing yeah. we're only down there now after the post-release tracking of the nut hatches, but we're down there about once a month and every time at every stop nearly we're seeing flocks of 10 to 30 to 40 flying around in the tops of the pines um just moving all over and, and for siskins yes siskins okay siskins i meant these guys oh i'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> you, i was like mm, you're like no, wait a minute i've never seen <laughs> flocks of creepers no 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 not these but siskins. okay gotcha Okay, so so brown creeper, a bird that looks like a little moving piece of bark. So if you're looking out at a tree and you see a relatively small slender piece of bark that is moving, you are not losing your mind. Um, that is probably a brown creeper. Um, as their name implies, they creep around, they glean with that long pointy bill um, insects from underneath bark strips. Um, and one of their behaviors is they sort of, and they also like, to me, they move like kind of jerkily. So though, I, I don't know if you all can see me honestly, so I shouldn't be just kind of gesturing around and trying to prove things with hand motions. Um, but they, they sort of jerk their way up and they'll go up a tree and they'll sort of circle it and circle it and circle it until they get to a high point. Um, and they will circle branches as well. But when they get up high, then they'll fly down to the base of the next tree and forage by starting to move up. So their song is ee. I've heard it described as he, 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 you can't see me. Okay, some very, very common uh, winter sparrows here in Missouri. These are great birds, I think, to practice your bird ID on um, because a lot of times you can see them at the base of your feeders, um, kind of right out in the open, eating seeds. They'll spend a pretty long time there. They're not, um, they don't spook particularly easily. Um, and so you can really get some good looks at the white crowned sparrow that's on the left and the white throated sparrow that is on the right. So I think a lot at first, these can be kind of confusing because what your eye is drawn towards is going to probably be the, you know, strongly striped black and white crown. Um, but you can see with these close up pictures, there are definitely some differences. The yellow lures, um, that area kind of between the eye and the bill and obviously the white throat on the white throated sparrow. So a little bit more on these guys. So you can see that we have um, a white morph version on the left and a tan morph version on the right. This is a species that tends to sing quite a lot while they're here in the winter. So it's a nice one to get to know for sound. So if you wanna go ahead and play that, Sarah, thanks. And 
keep that song in mind too for the next one. But did you want to play their call as well? You don't have to, but you can. I only put the call because it's, you know, when you see a big group of sparrows, sometimes a call can help kind of pick out. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes I hear this call before I actually see the bird down in the underbrush. And so they just have a really distinctive kind of chip note to me of that tink, tink, tink. It just sounds a lot different, but that comes. And it is, I, I think you're right too, that they, that call is often what will alert you to their presence in the first yeah. place. And then you can try and get eyes on them. Yeah. So the white crown sparrow, so you can see, so the deal is with this different plumage is that the bird on the right is a bird that at this time of year is, that's a bird that was hatched this year. Okay, so um, the bird will go through a molt next year and look like the bird on the left. So the left is an older bird. Um, the bird on the right is the bird in, in its first year of life. Um, and I wanted you all to try and remember the um, White Throated Sparrow song because I think that the White Crown starts off a little different, but you'll hear that it ends very differently. Hear how that starts off real whistly, very much like the White Throated and then goes all buzzy. So that's another species that will sing quite often here in the wintertime. Much higher pitched call than the tink of the white throated. Okay, so I like to use these species as an example because they're ones that I personally messed up on a Christmas bird count several years ago. Um, so for me, what my eye is drawn to when I see either of those species, these species is the reddish mohawk that they have. I mean, that's a really, really distinct characteristic. And that's, I'm like, oh, it has a red cap. Um, and so I was on a Christmas bird count with my partner, Ethan, and I said, oh, there's a few chipping sparrows over there. Mark them down. And he looks at me. He's like, they're not here. That's not right and I was like look at its red cap they told that's what they are and he was like you might want to look up American tree sparrow um so you can see quite a lot of, of of similarities here but you know looking really closely you can also see the differences the black eye line versus the the reddish eye line the different colors in the bill I realize that, I mean you're gonna have to be viewing the bird in binoculars of course um, but those are distinct differences between these species. But what really helps is that they really have very little overlap in seasonality. So they're here at different times. Chipping Sparrow is a, is a summer breeder, as you can see there on the left, and the American Tree Sparrow is here in the wintertime. Okay, so this is one that is this is tough for everyone. So if this is something that you, you know, feel that you have ID problems with, everyone else does too. Um, it takes, you'll eventually get better and better and better and more used to them. The house finch versus the purple finch. Um, and you can see, you know, these good descriptions that Sarah put in here, purple reddish covering most of the body looks wine stained. It's a, really a raspberry color. Um, and then you can see the house finch on the right is, has more of the brown streaks on side and the red is a little more concentrated also on the rump as well. The house finches that I see typically um, in person outside of photographs, to me, the red is more of like an orangey red as opposed to that raspberry red of the purple finch. Um, I think the most distinguishing or the easiest and most obvious sometimes characteristic is the eyebrow. So purple finches have this like really dramatic eyebrow and we'll actually see it a little more on the females even, which is the, to me, this is one of the few species where the females can often be easier to identify from one another. Well, we turned them around that time. So now pretty we have sneaky. the house, <laughs> pretty sneaky. Now we have the house finch on the left and the purple finch on the right. 
so you can see again the, the brown streakiness on the house finch the fact that that reddish color whatever hue you want to describe it to yourself as that helps you um, is not nearly as extensive on the house finch there on the left as the purple finch on the right and you can see those super distinctive face markings on the on the purple finch and that raspberry wine color mm -hmm. so here are the females um so you can see that's the house finch on the right and look at that purple finch on the left and how incredibly distinct her face markings are particularly the eyebrow and um these are some pictures that we got from cornell's all about birds which you might have mentioned that before, Sarah. And like, there, it's just, it's such an awesome resource. I will have to say though, that this, like, I feel like when I see purple finches, it's even more distinctive than that. I mean, it's just like a white eyebrow. Definitely, so, they definitely have face I, I markings. Just, I would advise like practicing with these two species right here. All, you know, if you get a good look at the head, almost practicing on the females is easier at first. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. Oh, and I did not mention it. So Dana was talking about allaboutbirds.org. It's run by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, which we've mentioned a few times. They have incredible educational resources. Um, they have a whole field guide of every North American bird. Um, I think North, no, not North American, at least US bird, but I think North American, but you type in the name, you do natural history about it, range maps, just information about uh, all of its life history and it's just an amazing resource. It has songs and a lot of different photos um, to peruse. That's all about birds.org. It's one it of the great sources for brand new beginners and people who've been doing this stuff forever. Yep. I just put the link in the chat. Oh, great. Um, so white winged and red crossbills. Um, and this is one that does come down in small numbers um but when there's an eruption here it's another one that that can be fairly dramatic in its abundance um red excuse me yeah red crossbills more so than white wing crossbills although we have both here this year um that bird on the left the male white winged crossbill um that photo was actually taken by someone that I work with that's in Arrow Rock. And I know a lot of birders were able to go to Arrow Rock. This guy hung out for a really long time and was really cooperative and let people get like 10 feet away and just hang out and watch him. Um, the female white-winged crossbill is there on the upper right. And then you can see the male on the top and female on the bottom of red crossbills there on the, on the far right-hand side. So Sarah, if you go to the next slide, I'm, just, I'm not going to ask you to play this whole video. It's like three minutes long, but this, and it's not so much that I'm wanting to show people super close ups of the red crossbills themselves, but I wanted to point out their behavior. So this is a video that um, my partner Ethan took in our backyard. And so you can watch a little bit their behavior. So these, the crossbills, their, their bill is, is specialized for pulling pine seeds out of pine cones. I don't know how well this video is showing up for everyone. I know it's really hard to put video on Zoom, um, but hopefully you can see they kind of just crawl all over the pine cones and are lifting out um, pine cone seeds with their little crossbills. So we got a male and female there. Thanks, Sarah. You can you can head on. Cool. So my last bird that I want to talk about is the common red pole. Um, and you can see the this range map there on the lower right actually has if i'm sorry if it's small for y'all i know it's sometimes hard with this format but yeah sarah's pointing out the, oh, the dotted blue line um that is actually indicative of where they go to during an eruption so there's their eruptive movement and then the lighter blue in which um most of missouri is apart is winter but scarce 
So I don't know how many folks on this call have been lucky enough to see a red pole. Um, I've seen one literally one time in my backyard for 30 minutes. It stayed and then disappeared, never saw it again. Um, <laughs> but a really nice little bird. So you can see the, the sort of delicate cone shaped but pointy bill, not quite as pointy as the pine siskin, um, but that, that, that red cap in the front there. Um, there's really nothing else that has that. This is a, a relatively small bird overall. Um, and so you can see there that there is some common thread here, right? Like brown streaks is a thing that we, we all need to get used to. Um, but if you if you are able to get a closer look, you can see things like, you know, the black chin, the, the black by the eyes, um, things that will help you over time distinguish these from, from other species that we've maybe talked about tonight. Winter specialty. This is me. Oh, back to me. <laughs> okay. Back to you, Command Central. Back to me, Command Central. Okay, we're gonna go over a few woodpeckers and raptors uh, here at the end. So um, I get questions from people, not as often as I used to, but I get questions um, and just some general confusion between these two species. If you're if you're already a birder, you know the difference, but if you're a newbie, sometimes it can be kind of confusing because the red bellied, you see red on the head. You don't see that light reddish wash on its tum tum um, when it's perched on your suet or on a tree. Um, and so very clear differences between the red bellied and the red headed. The red headed, if you see a red headed woodpecker, you know, because it's a deep, deep red head all over the head down into the, uh, into the breast a little bit and just striking blocks of color, that black and white. Uh, the red bellied is, has that black and white barring that's so distinctive on the back all the way down into the, the rectrices, the, the tail feathers. Um, also, its head's a little more orangey um, and the red headed is just this deep, deep red. Their sounds, their voices are also very different. These are both resident birds. They're here year round, um, of course, and they can both kind of be. Red bellied woodpeckers are far more common they're found in forest, woodland neighborhoods, pretty much anywhere with trees, honestly. Um, they're way more common than red-headed woodpeckers. Red-headed woodpeckers are kind of a woodland indicator. And what's a woodland? A woodland is more open than a forest. It has some trees removed so that the, the light can, can come through the canopy to support like a rich vegetative layer underneath. And so a forest just has the leaf litter and a sub canopy. There's no, none of that management to open up portions to let light through the canopy. A woodland uh, is a managed area that has more open, like park-like setting is what red-headed woodpeckers like and what they breed in. So you might see them on telephone poles nearby to woods or forests. They want that very open uh, park-like atmosphere and they're actually declining um, and red-bellied woodpeckers are doing okay. Their songs are also songs. It's kind of weird to call a woodpecker sound a song, but whatever, they're songs too. Um, their call is like a rolling chur or a chim cham. the sound of a red-bellied woodpecker. Very comforting. The sound of the red-headed woodpecker is not as comforting. <laughs> this is one that applies to the prettier the bird, the uglier the sound, because it's just like a scream. <laughs> kind of a rough, shrill scream or chur, as opposed to that rolling sound of the red-bellied. They also, redheaded's if you do find them somewhere in really good numbers, so for instance, up by Swan Lake, we do the Christmas bird count at um, Yellow, Yellow River CA, Yellow Creek, Yellow Creek CA, and they're typically very, very abundant there, um, even though, I mean, you're completely right that they're not as common as red-bellied and they're declining sure. as well, um, but when you do lock into a, an area where they're abundant, they are really really hyper birds i mean they're just yeah. like fighting and yelling at each other and yelling Very at vocal. you and yelling at everything else yeah so and it's but they look like they're wearing a tuxedo with a, a ruby jeweled head so it's okay <laughs> they're so beautiful yeah no that's totally right if you luck into exactly if you luck into an area that has a lot of acorns and a lot of food for them in the winter the family groups they're just a bunch of them they just all seem to pile in 
uh, and yeah, fight with each other. They're very, very vocal. Yeah, that's good. Okay, Downy and Harry. Um, these are uh, another pair of species that look very similar outside of their size and shape. So size and shape and bill size are our indicators here to tell the two apart. Um, these again are very common and you can see them together wherever they occur in forest or backyards or woodlands or again most places with trees you will find these two species. So downy woodpeckers on the left and hairy woodpeckers on the right. Uh, the biggest um, the biggest clue for these two is that one is clearly almost twice the size, but that's impossible to tell if you only see the hairy or the downy alone. You don't see them on this same feeder <laughs> to clearly tell the difference. Someone lucked out with that photo or maybe it's a fake photo. Um, but here on the left, you see a downy and its bill is about half the width. I don't know what, sorry, that link keeps coming up, but its bill is about half the width of its whole head. So if you, it sounds weird, but if you folded back its beak on its head, it would only go half of the ways of the head. Whereas if you folded back, which is weird, a hairy woodpecker's bill, it's almost the entire width of the head. So it just sticks out a whole lot farther than the downies does. Um, you can see that here as well in this photo. Other than that, they look very similar. You see the females on the top with no red on the head and the males at the bottom with the red on the back of the head. That's the differentiation there. Um, the downy woodpecker, um, I know squeaks doesn't really help you, but the rattle gets faster at the end. Kind of slows down, slows down towards the end. Now a hairy is much higher pitched. I think it kind of sounds like a dog toy, like a real high pitched squeaky dog toy. And its rattle is the same speed throughout. It's a much more forceful squeaky call. And then the rattle, I think is this, uh-oh, uh-oh. It's not working. It won't let me click on it. <laughs> anyway, it's the same speed throughout. Here. Again, it takes some practice with time to tell the difference between these two, but there are little clues that can help you. Yellow-bellied sapsucka. So they are only here in the winter. Apparently I was gonna write more about them and I did not, but they're also found in forest and woodland. Um, they are really cool birds. I get a lot of questions about when people see the immature birds, which are right here, that don't have the striking red yet on the head and the throat. Um, and they just, again, haven't molted into um, breeding plumage. And so yellow, but they have a yellow wash on their belly, hence the name, but they also have this striking red um, stripe down the front of their head and on their throat. And um, just really striking birds. No other bird has those black and white bold stripes on the face with the red on the on the on the forehead and the throat. And isn't it right, Dana, that the females don't have red on the throat, but they do on the head? Okay, I should probably know that, but that's okay. We're all learning here, remember? <laughs> and so um, the teacher becomes the student. And so if you see dots like this or, or um, wells um, on a tree like this in perfect rows, that's the work of a yellow-bellied sapsucker. And so they have to continue uh, maintaining those wounds on the tree to lap the sap up off the tree. And so they like trees like maples and birch and things like that that have sap inside that can feed them uh, that are very high in sugar and thus energy for them in the winter. So they only happen here in the winter and they're very cool birds. Their sound is kind of interesting um, because they're far less common birds here in the winter. Every time I hear it, I have to remind myself what it is, but it's kind of a scratchy mew sound. Doesn't sound like our other <coughs> Such a weird sound. <laughs> okay, evening grosbeak possibilities. So this is another species that's only here in the winter. I, I, I will admit something to all the birders out there, good birders and beginners. I've never seen an evening gross bee. <laughs> Don't judge neither, me. I haven't either. So 
both of your hosts of this webinar have never seen this bird. I know. And let's let's all recognize that there are some really awesome birders on this webinar who would be able to tell you even gross beak tales. But we don't have any yet, so we need to make some data. But they occur here. There are a few here in the winter, off and on, like reports of them, which is great. The people usually post on the MoBirds email list serve, and folks are able to go chase them and, and look at them. Really beautiful birds. Just so, so beautiful. This is a range map. So this is one of the rare range maps that shows that non-breeding scarce um, color, that whole different color down here, which covers up most of the lower 48. Um, but you can see they their residents appear in the boreal and then they move down um, when they need to for food. Okay, sharp shin hawk. We're gonna cover sharp shin hawk and Cooper's hawk because they look very similar for folks who aren't aware. And so I'm going to show you Cooper's hawk real fast, just because they look so similar. They have that rusty white, uh, rusty and white barring down the front, and a dark back. Both of them have that as adults. The juveniles also look very similar. Um, this is a picture of a juvenile in flight down here. They have this blocky brown streaks um, vertical, and they both have that. You can see it on the lower left picture here on Cooper's. So we'll start with sharp shin, and there's a few things you can look for, though. Uh, all of those are kind of hard to tell sometimes in the field. So don't be, again, be too hard on yourself. Sharp shin hawks, you know, both of these hawks are pretty small. They're like um, a little bit bigger than a blue jay. Um, Coopers are a little bit bigger, but they're both relatively small, small hawks. And so sharp shins uh, have a small head that looks small relative to their body. So you look at that Sharpie and its head looks kind of tiny for the size of its body. It doesn't look proportional. Their head is also rounded. It has a rounded shape to it as opposed to look at the Coopers. It's more blocky, kind of um, has that blocky characteristic, kind of cuts off more sharply in the back. Whereas Sharpshins have that roundy, just dome, small head. And then their tail, it's especially helpful when they're perched and you can see their tail clearly or when they're in the flight, they have a squared off tail. It's pretty blunt and just uh, easy to tell in a silhouette sometimes. Now Coopers have a large blocky head. You look at this bird and its head looks more proportional to its body size. It's not just like a little ball sitting on the top of its body. It looks a lot bigger. It's blocky and squared off. They both have that red eye um, as adults. And they have a graduated tail, which means that the bottom of the, their tail looks like this rather than squared off, it's graduated. Um, and so if they're perched and you can see the bottom of the tail, that's all well and good, but it's kind of hard to see if you, or, or hard to tell the difference. So again, don't be too hard on yourself with these. They're difficult for many people. Um, I have some quizzes here, but we can talk about which ones these are. And so this might, this tail does not look as cut off and squared off, but it is, as opposed to this one. Look at this graduated tail, definitely not squared off. So this one also big blocky large head. So this one is a Coopers. This one is a sharp shin because it's got squared off tail, small rounded head, blocky big head, big block head that Coopers with a graduated tail. This one, it's a little bit roundy, it's a little bit graduated, bigger head, Coopers. <laughs> this is the, I don't think this head looks very small in this picture down here. <laughs> Some people think the head is pretty diagnostic. I don't know. I don't think the head looks very small in that picture, but look at the tail. It's very squared off. So those are kind of your telltale signs for those two. Do you have anything else for that one, Dana? Just that these are pretty tough. These two species oh, yeah. are pretty tough. Like, unless, I mean, one thing that helps me is if it's a female Cooper's or a male Sharpie, then by size, that is, mm -hmm. that is very helpful. So as in most raptors, the male, or excuse me, the female is bigger. And so there's really a lot of overlap between the smaller male Cooper's hawks and the larger female sharp shins hawks, sharp shinned hawks. Um, if you get a if you get a female Cooper's and a male Sharpie, they're pretty darn different in size, but otherwise it's a, it's a tough one. It is a tough one, especially when they're juveniles. I find that even more difficult. I get a lot of questions about what is this bird based on Sharpies and Coopers. Okay, red-tailed hawk. 
a really common one. And you'll see a lot of them here in the winter because a lot of them that breed up north come down for the winter. So we have not only our birds that breed here who may move a little bit farther south, there's just a lot of movement, but there's all those birds that are farther north of us that come down too. So there's a lot more concentrated. That's why if you tend to see a ton more red tailed uh, perched by the side of the road where we generally see them the most because that's where we're going the most in our cars. Um, that's why there's a bunch more down here. Um, so there's a lot of variation in this bird. Um, there's a lot of different subspecies. Well, not a lot, but a handful. And we won't really cover those here. We're just going to cover the basics. But um, so there's a white V on the back on the scapulars on adults um, that you can see here when they're perched. So if their back is to you, and their tail is not that deep, that that red red yet. Sometimes, or the lighting is just bad. Sometimes you can tell by that white V in the scapulars on the back. Um, and red tails, regardless of age, all have this dark um, dark bar between the shoulder and the wrist of the bird, called a is that patagial um, band up on the leading edge of the wing. So they always have these dark patches right here um, on the underwing if you see them in flight and they don't and they, I mean, the red tail is clearly an indicator. <laughs> but if they're in different plumages, um, that, that dark mark uh, can, can be indicative. Um, they also have a belly band. They have these, this streaking across the belly in like what looks like a cummerbund, but that's highly variable as well. You see this one looks a lot different. Uh, than this one. This one's clearly very dark. The tail isn't red yet. Um, so that, again, there's just a lot of variation with age and different subspecies. They make the sound that an eagle makes on TV. <coughs> Eagles do not sound super cool. They do like a clucky sound. <laughs> <coughs> red tail's got the cool sound. I do love eagles though. I have to say that because everybody loves eagles. Everybody loves an eagle. Okay. Um, and then these are, this is a slide by Paul McKenzie um, uh, that he put together just to show a lot of this variation. So these are Eastern birds and light morphs. And so there's a dark morph as well of this bird. But just to show you some pictures, it's, we don't have to go through all these, but just some pictures of the, the wide variation. Look at all these different belly bands. Look how some are thick, some are real thick spots. Some are lighter, you can hardly see them. Some have that really, really distinctive tail. So I just think it's helpful sometimes to, to show the variation. Okay, we've gotten through most of our species. Well, all of our species, and we're gonna do a mini quiz. So get a piece of paper or just remember your answer. It's on the honor system, so don't cheat. But we'll go through really fast. I'll give you 20 seconds or we can just go through, we'll go through them together after that. So we can just look at them for a minute. I'll give you a few awkward Zoom silence, a few seconds of Zoom silence, and then we will move forward. Dana, can you still see that weird stripe on the screen? You can, that's good. That's good. Okay. Hope, it, hope maybe everybody's written down the first few or you're just thinking it in your head, which is fine. Okay, we're not gonna have anybody guess or, or yell out, but <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just tell you what it is. I'll talk about the characteristics first. So on the first bird, right here, we see this blocky squared off head. We see a kind of graduated tail, but that's kind of hard to see at this angle. But the head size, it's pretty, uh, um, pretty, what's the word I'm trying to think of? It's pretty big and proportional to its body size and just real blocky. So which one's the blockhead? Coopers, it's a Cooper's hawk. That's a pretty good graduated tail. I think that's pretty yeah, good. Yeah, it is. It looks longer in the, in the middle for sure. Oh, they're so cool. Okay, now this one, we looked at this very picture. <laughs> it's a little bit easier. It's got a red tail. It's got that dark bar between the shoulder and the wrist. It is a red-tailed hawk. It's a red-tailed hawk. Okay, what about this one? Oh, I just saw it soaring overhead really quickly, but I noticed it had a really squared off tail. That makes it a... Sharp shinned. A sharp shinned. That's right. All right, what about this guy? 
I saw this. I saw this guy with a real black and white streaky back, but it had a red head. So I think it's a red-headed woodpecker. <laughs> and you would say, "No, it is a red-bellied woodpecker." But you did not see this yellow wash on the belly. But you just know, red-bellied. Okay. Oh, toughy. That's a tough one. It's a toughy. It's got. It looks kind of wine stained, but only on the breast and on the head but it doesn't have that wine stain all over the body. It's got these really brown, brown streaks. streaks. Brown streaks. I think it must be a house finch. <laughs> we have some guesses in the chat too. And everybody's been right. Hey! That's, that's, been that's great. Cause I chat. can't see that. So I'm glad you're telling me that. Oh, this one. Remember way back to this one. Super streaky, super, super pointy bill. We've got some yellow in the wings but not strikingly so super super streaky it's a pine siskin <laughs> pine siskin it's a pine siskin all right last one look at that beak so it's is got a super beak? long beak if you is folded that... its beak back onto its head which happens really often it'll almost be the width of its whole head which makes it a dana Harry Woodpecker. That's right. Yep. Look at that beak. It is, it's very large and chunky, and it is not half the width no. of its head. It is the whole right. the whole width. Correct. It is very large and in charge. Okay. All right. I just put this up because this this is a really, really, really cool resource. So a handful of years ago, I was like, MDC, we gotta make a free bird quiz online. There, there's no free bird quiz anywhere that you don't have to pay for. And then eBird made one, which is way better than if we made one. So so this eBird quiz, which is just eBird.org slash quiz, is super cool because you can put in your location and time of year and it gives you birds that will occur at that date or time of year in that location. So if you want to practice your winter birds, you can put in Columbia, Missouri, you can put in anywhere on the map in that top row. And then you put in the time of year by date. So you can put in, I want during migration, I want during breeding, I want in the winter, fall, whatever. And you choose whether you want to take a photo quiz or a sound quiz. Um, and what's really neat, it's being populated by all the eBirders and everybody submitted media from their eBird lists or from the Macaulay Library. And so it's a way to rank, it's a way to crowdsource the ranking of how good their photos are. So I'll show you. So I put in these, oh, people are writing on accident, I think on the screen. Um, and so, so, oh, where'd it go? Oh, anyway, my slide must've disappeared. But um, when you choose, when it shows you a picture of a bird, Carolina Wren was on here and you click Carolina Wren and then it makes you rank the picture one to five stars and then you move on to the next bird. So it's kind of cool. It's a way to kind of crowdsource the massive amount of information going into eBird from everybody's media. So it's a really neat resource. And every time you take the quiz, they're all different pictures and all different sounds and all different media because there's just so much to choose from. So it's a great place to go practice. So I really encourage that. So I will turn it over to Dana for a few final comments, but thank you all so much for attending. This was really, really fun and had a ton of interest. I think over 200 people signed up. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And please reach out to us if you have any questions. Hey everybody, I put a couple things in the chat. I've actually had, I've been trying to keep up with the chat, but it's been pretty tough because, the, the, yeah. which is great. There's like a lot of conversation going on between people. Um, Thanks a bunch to Edge. I saw you answered a lot of questions. So that was super Thank helpful. Thank you, Edge. Um, and so I just want to mention really briefly, I know we've kept people here longer because Sarah and Dana can talk about birds for- I know, I'm sorry. Apparently limitless. Like aren't, both of us can talk about it for a limitless time. <laughs> um, so just keep an eye out for upcoming things. Sarah mentioned that MBS, we're going to be doing more workshops. We are once the- covid crisis calms down again we are going to be coupling these workshops with field trips um so we had planned to do that this time but things got really spiky with covid so we wanted to all err on the side of caution um but more workshops with mbs and as well as our um regular spring and fall meetings as well. So I assume a lot of people on here came to this webinar through MBS, but just in case, mobirds.org. Um, so the Missouri River Bird Observatory, I'm gonna put something 
in the chat. We actually have about 35 or so recorded webinars on birding, including like a birding 101 and they're great. A bunch of different stuff. Sarah's given a few. So I'm going to put that in the chat and you have to kind of like scroll through because they start back in April and they go to present. So I'm going to throw that in the chat. And then Sarah, if you want to say something about Yes, MDC I is the virtual you see on the, yeah, you see the link on the screen there, mdc.mo.gov slash events slash virtual. So same as everybody else, during COVID, we've really tried to adapt and hold virtual webinars that have all been recorded and they're available online. Um, and then they have future events on that site um, that are virtual that you can attend from home. A lot of really, really, really different, different, different um, webinars on a lot of different topics. On January 7th, I'm going to be holding a webinar similar to this, to Winter Bird ID. Um, this webinar will clearly be recorded and posted online, so that's great. You can send that to people as well, but um, we felt that there was a lot of demand. And so if there are other people you know who weren't able to attend, um, we're going to try and, well, I'm going to try and provide more resources. We all are. So we're, we're hoping to move forward with a, a few different webinars. Um, as time moves on to try and adapt to COVID. It's not as fun as being together in person, but at least it's something and um, it's still fun to connect with all of you, even if it's virtually, so. Agreed. Sarah, I think we have really just a couple questions um, okay. that, you know, Edge or other people didn't chime in on in the chat, or at least I didn't see that these got answered. Um, so this is a big one and I know we have a lot of answers probably, but is there a book that tells all about each species, not just how to ID them, but like, like you know, natural history, um, Ooh, you know what's summaries. Really good book? It's called The Birder's Handbook. Hold on, I have it over here. This book is so important. It's one of the ones I brought from my office into my house because it's so good. It's called The Birder's Handbook. Good one guide to the natural history of North American birds and every page has a different species uh, on the left so we have bear prairie chicken and it talks about the type of nest how many nests how long incubation is how long the nestling period is and then a bunch of different information right here and then on the right side they talk about just different bird topics bird ecology topics so on the left there's always species and on the right there's always several articles about like heath hens and population sizes lex um, just a bunch of different, it's just such a cool book. Um, so I really recommend that. That is a really good one. Yeah, it's a Sarah, good one. Sarah, I was you? also going to bring up, yes. this is, this is um, former state ornithologist Brad Jacobs. This is his book. Yeah. That's Birds in Missouri. I think it is still sold by MDC. Is that true? It is. Yep. And okay. it's a great holiday gift. It's about, I think it's $30. And it's just it's it's just really cool and it's very missouri specific and it's it's just it's delightful and there's so yes. many there's like so many <laughs> there are a ton of books but those are two yeah really good ones there are a lot it also has a lot of really beautiful art and it's a great coffee table book that's also super super informative informative yep um and then the other question that i really don't see was answered was um someone asked is there a state park or i assume any you know public land in Missouri, that's really good for short leaf pine um, to see some of these eruptive species that we've talked about. So yeah, so there you. is some good pine um, at Pine Ridge outside of Ashland. It's a very small patch. Sorry, um, it's a very small patch outside of Ashland. But the area I'm talking about is down between Winona and Van Buren. Um, it's Highway 60 runs between them, and then it's south on Highway J. Um, there's a lot of shortleaf pine woodland down there that the Mark Twain National Forest, it's in the Mark Twain National Forest. Um, they've done a lot of management um, down there to open it up. So that's where I'm referring to when I say all of these birds are, are hanging out down there. So it's pretty, it's a haul. It's a pretty far drive, but it's super worth it. So I'm going to suggest we let people go just because... Yeah. We did try for 45 minutes, I swear, y'all. Yeah. But um, what we'll do is um, we will send a follow-up email um, to everyone that registered, even people that couldn't make it tonight. We'll send a link to the recording and we'll send some um, just links to different things that we've talked about. And I'm sure Sarah and I can come up with other things that we want everybody to know about as well. So thank you yeah. so much for joining us and all of you and for sticking with us. And I hope everyone has a great weekend. Have a good weekend. Be well, be safe, be smart. Happy birding.
Thank you. 